بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We will begin the early childhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Here's the game plan for today <coughs> Let's quickly review lesson 6 questions and alhamdulillah we can also, since this is a smaller class, we can share our highlight or low light of the week um, and then I'll, there's one student question that I wanted to go over and then we'll begin lesson 7 uh, questions so who wants to share their highlight or low light of the I'll week? begin inshallah so we completed everyone's highlight or low light of the week let's quickly review some of the questions <coughs> from last week what are two benefits of writing down your eulogy which have basis from the Quran and Sunnah? So you can just shout it out. You guys can just blurt it out. What are two benefits of writing down your eulogy based upon the Quran and Sunnah? Okay, the dua will be more sincere because they know who you are. And number two, so you can leave a legacy and follow the uh, Sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, the Prophet alayhi salam, was born in the month of? In the year of? On a? And the precise, precise date of his birth is? Yes. Allah said, Today I have completed my religion upon you. What do scholars derive from this verse? Okay, Muhammad was the last prophet but everything that we needed to know about his seerah we know everything that has been left out we wish someone went to Umm Ayman and to Baraka and asked her about the early childhood of Muhammad so we would have a wealth of information right, look at the, there's only a few pages of the early childhood of Muhammad she knew him from the birth all the way till death. But Allah knows best, we don't have those narrations. But our mindset is everything that we needed to know about the deen, we know. What are two reasons as far as why the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal is such a popular opinion for the birthday of Muhammad wasallam? Even though the most authentic opinion is the eighth. Why is the twelfth such a popular opinion? Those of you who are coming late, you can just shout out the answer for now. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. So the Yes. So one of the, when Ibn Ishaq was compiling his book of Sirah, one one thing people forget to realize is that he was compiling all of the narrations. Most of the time he would provide the isnad and sometimes he wouldn't provide the sanad, the chain. And this time he didn't provide it. <coughs> what are the six guidelines for celebrating the birthday of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Who remembers any of the guidelines? Don't pick a specific date. Okay, there is no specific date because we don't know the specific date. Don't look down on the people who don't celebrate. Don't look down upon those who don't come to the milad. Right. No need to discuss just the birth the whole night and then you miss the fajr prayer. <laughs> no, don't make sweets fuddled upon the people and you make, you're making them donate and that's not permissible when you force someone to donate for something they don't want to okay there is no fill in the blanks there is no need to add blank to the sirah right, there's no need to add fabricated and fluff stories to make it rosy it's already astounding one of the distinctions between Islam and other religions is that we have a scientific methodology to verify our sources. What is this called? 
Isnad. Abdullah bin Mubarak said, Isnad is from the religion. And if there was no such, such thing as the Isnad, then? Then? People would say whatever it is they wanted to say. In whose house was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam born? <coughs> Abu Talib. Okay. According to Ibn Hisham, there were three action items Abdul Muttalib did when he received the news of the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What did he do? That was Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. What about Abdul Muttalib? What were the three things that he did? According to Ibn Hisham. So he sacrificed. So he sacrificed. All oh, right, right. Aqiqa. He had an aqiqa for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very nice. I don't, yeah, I don't think he, he may have, but it's not written that he did. But the circum yeah, circumcision from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the seventh day. Welcome, Kenneth. Okay. I want you all to welcome Brother Kenneth to our class. Mashallah, he became Muslim a few weeks ago. How did Abu Lahab react to the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? All right, she's... She so yeah, yeah. Like they say, it doesn't matter how you start, what's more important is how you end your life. Who knew Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the longest period of time? Baraka, Umm Ayman. So list 10 facts about Umm Ayman. So tell me any of the facts that you remember from Umm Ayman. She was from Abyssinia. Right, she was the slave of Muhammad Sallallahu father, Abdullah. Okay, I should have made a distinction between facts and inference. So we could infer that it's possible that since those three were in the household of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that she could have been the first one to hold Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not mentioned in the narrations, but this is something we can infer. Okay? Yep, she was made to Zayd bin Haritha. Yep, Zayd bin Haritha. She had a son by the name of Usama bin Zayd. She was given the title of my mother after my mother. Muhammad, Muhammad Sallallahu did not introduce her as my servant or my slave, but he introduced, introduced her as the mother of my mother. After my mother, right? Right. She was present in the Battle of Uhud. <coughs> she was the, second woman to the second woman to accept Islam. She was a woman of paradise. Remember that? A woman of paradise. The Prophet ﷺ would joke around with her. Like, like how a mother playfully jokes around with her son. And there's a few inferences that we can derive from the narrations. She consoled Amina. She stayed with Amina throughout her pregnancy. She was the first one to hold him. Okay. Why didn't Islam abolish slavery immediately? Change takes time. Change, takes time. Right. Change is a process. Slavery existed in every part of the world. Slavery was practiced through different means during that time. What were some of those means? Prisoners of war, through abduction, kidnapping. When Islam came, the Prophet Muhammad said, through kidnapping, through abduction, it is impermissible. And through, uh, through debts, they are, it is imp impermissible. Islam abolished all of these means of slavery with the aim of one day abolishing it. Uh, 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 and so it limited the sources of slavery and one day it did abolish it. Explain the interpretation of Ibn Kathir and Ibn Rajab that the light was coming out of the stomach of Amina bint Wahab, the mother of Muhammad during her dream. So how did these scholars derive this 
this narration. How, how do they explain this narration? Okay, it was Noor that it came, the Noor came all the way to Asham, right? So what will that, what does that mean? Islam will have a stable and firm footing in Surya. What did the Prophet say about the leadership of Usama bin Zayd, Baraka's son, Um Ayman's son? So what did she say, what did the Prophet say about his leadership when they were questioning his leadership? Did they question his father's leadership? They questioned his father's leadership. And? Okay. And indirectly, you could say that this is praising Um Ayman, Baraka, the Abyssinian. Okay. Someone asked, so we finished the lesson six pre-quiz uh, pre questions. Now I, w I wanted to go over one question. A few weeks ago, I asked all of you to write down a 10 question quiz based upon Bloom Taxonomy. Uh, the verbs. So two questions for, for facts, two questions on, on applying. Um, so, oops. so I wanted you to think of higher level questions. So this is one, okay, some, uh, someone asked this question as well. What were the names of the, of the ten uncles of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So I'll forward this, you can read these ten names on your own time. Someone also asked about the names of the foster brothers and sisters of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you can read that on your own time and write it down. So someone asked this question during uh, the quiz that you were supposed to create on your own. Uh, Sister Helena, right? imagine that you were dropped off in pre-Islamic Arabia. How would you navigate this pagan society while staying on Tawheed? Right? <laughs> So now, to your partner on your right or on your left, think about this question and discuss it for the next minute. Because we, we have been discussing pre-Islamic Arabia up to now. So imagine you right now were dropped off in that time period. How are you going to stay upon the oneness of Allah, the Tawheed? Go ahead. Why did Amina send her child Muhammad وسلم, into the desert in his early childhood? Okay, yep. So the Sheikh, he gives a few reasons. I'm going to go over those reasons right now. Now this may, this may seem strange to us, sending your infant child into the, de into the desert. But this is something they used to do. The elite, the e not all of the Arabs, but the elite families of the Quraysh especially, they would send off their infant sons soon after the birth so that in the desert they are now suckled and weaned and spend part of their childhood with the Bedouin tribes. And today as well, sometimes we have the rich families uh, hiring nannies to take care of the kids. It's likewise, it was customary to entrust the infants with the wet nurses that belong to the nomadic Bedouin tribes. So here are four reasons why they would do this. Reason number one, as Dr. Famida mentioned, they wanted the infant to be surrounded by a natural environment. They wanted the infant to be surrounded <coughs> by a natural environment. To maintain the natural fitrah, the natural purity that a child is born upon, and to promote the correct development of both the mind and the body, the elite of the Quraysh would send the children to be raised in the desert. Sheikh Muhammad Ghazali writes, It is indeed a wretched thing that our children live and stay in constrained apartments and they are immersed in artificial settings. Even when they're outside, they are immersed in artificial settings. According to the common sense media, teens spend more than seven hours a day on entertainment. Not, this, does not, uh, this report does not include schoolwork. 
So some may say, they think it's, it's in regards to school. No, this is in regards to purely entertainment. Seven hours a day, according to the recent report. So we need to admire the people of Mecca of that time because the desert was the first playground. And what a playground it was. How spacious and such a natural setting. The famous educator Howard Gardner said, "Children, this is, he said this in 1983, children learn in one of eight ways. One of those eight ways, he said, they're a naturalist. So he came up with this theory in 1983. Thousands of years ago, the pre-Islamic Arabs stated that a natural environment is recommended so that the child's perception of the world become in harmony with the realities of the universe in which they live. That's what he said, thousands, that's what they, that's what they used to do thousands of years ago. Professor Tariq Ramadan mentioned <laughs> that in the first few years of the Prophet's life, he developed a specific relationship with nature that remained constant throughout his mission. The desert opens the human mind to observation, meditation, initiation into meaning and purpose. Once again, the desert opens the human mind to observation, initiation and meditation into meaning and purpose. And that's why many verses of the Quran talk about the creation and the teachings we can derive from the creation. As Allah says, you can look, look this up on your own time as well in Surah, uh, Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 190. In samawati wal ard. Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alteration of the night and the day, these are all signs for people of understanding. Rasulullah said, Woe be to that person who hears this verse and does not reflect on it. Woe to that person who hears this verse and does not meditate on it. So let's reflect on this verse. Our atmosphere is clear. Our moon is the right size and distance from the earth. Gravity stabilizes earth's rotation. The sun has the precise mass and composition. All of these facts are necessary for earth's habitabil habitability. All of these facts are surprisingly crucial to the discovery of the universe by scientists. Look at the harmony of earth and the moon, how they work together to sustain earthly life as one intricate system. Allah says in another verse, Surah 41, Surah Fusilat, Ayah 53, Allah says, I will show you my, the signs of my existence through the universe and through your own self. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ We will show them the signs of our existence through the universe. The cre ponder over the creation of the sky, the sun, the stars, the moon, the galaxies. Who else but a deliberate designer could have designed this planet? The complexity of our planet clearly indicates to a deliberate designer who not only designed this world but sustains it today. The, uni the universe operates by uniform laws of nature. Why is the universe so orderly? Why is the universe so reliable? Gravity remains cons consistent. The earth rotates in approximately the same 24 hours a day. The speed of light doesn't change. Why? We will show them our signs through the universe. So instead of asking, I don't know if God exists, you should ask instead, are human beings the accidental products of a blind and uncaring universe? Or are we the beneficiaries of a cosmic order that was planned beforehand to help us flourish? The desert is apparently devoid of life, but the desert repeatedly shows and proves to the reality of the miracle of the return to life. 
the first years of Muhammad وسلم, early childhood in the desert fashioned his outlook on life and prepared him to understand the signs of the universe. That's reason number one why they would send, why the noble Quraysh would send their infant sons to the desert. The second reason to avoid large gatherings. Back then, the rate of infant mortality was quite high. To protect the child, they removed him from civilization and from congregation. So now there are only a few people interacting with the child. As we know, plague and disease are carried by people. By avoiding large gatherings, this increases the child's chance of survival. Even today, some pediatricians will recommend that before the infant receives all of its vaccines, approximately the six month mark, the infant should avoid large gatherings and events. The third reason <coughs> why they would send the infant uh, into the desert with the wet nurses to adapt to the harsh climate of Mecca. It's a little bit different the way we parent today. Today, parents don't want their kids to fail. If our kids can't tie their shoelaces, we don't let them struggle, we tie it right away. If our kids fall, we pick them up right away. If they can't zip up their jacket, we zip it up quickly for them. When they can't do their homework, we quickly do it for them. We don't allow them to struggle. But the Quraysh of that time, they were thinking long term. They weren't thinking short term. They wanted the child to adjust to a rough life in a harsher environment in the desert so they become accustomed to Mecca. Now they can adapt easily to the hardships of Mecca. Psychologists have discussed the idea that what we perceive as the norm at a younger age becomes our frame of reference for normal. That's what we think is normal. Children adapt much more easily than adults. Allah has designed us in this manner. When we are adults, if we are used to a standard and we are diminished to a lower standard, life is difficult. For example, if we're, when we travel, if we're used to five-star hotels and we stay at a five-star hotel for four nights and then for the next four nights we stay at a one-star hotel or at a motel, our life will be difficult. Even though this standard, the motel or the one-star hotel, it would be paradise for some people. So it's human nature that children adapt to circumstances. And this shows that the Quraysh had clever long-term planning. <coughs> they wanted their children to live under difficulty, under a one-star hotel at a young age, so that Mecca appears like a five-star hotel. When I was nine, my parents took me to Pakistan for three months in Karachi. Every day, all five of us complained of the heat. Every day in the summer. None of the Pakistani kids would complain. They had adapted to the weather. We would always complain, there's nothing to do. There's no Game Boy. I don't know if you guys remember Game Boy. But there's no, there is no, uh, there's no baseball fields. There's no basketball fields. There's no football fields. But then we look out the window and we see these kids in barefoot. They're, they're, they're barefoot. They're playing cricket with a garbage can as the wicket, raggedy old tennis ball, and they have a tree branch as the bat. And they're happy. They have adapted to the harsh conditions of Karachi. They can make anything fun. So that was the third reason why they would send uh, the, the infant son to, into the desert to adapt. And the fourth reason, <coughs> to learn pure Arabic. Everything decayed in the city, including the language. This one is one of their most precious possessions.
Few of the Arabs could read, but beauty of speech was a virtue all of the Arab parents desired for their kids. And the best poets lived where? In the desert. That's where pure Arabic, they didn't want the Yemenis or these other Arab tribes coming in and corrupting their kids' language, language, they would send them off to the desert where the purity of the language was still intact. In the desert, you got fresh air for the lungs, pure Arabic for the tongue. Some of the sons would stay there for up to eight years in the desert. How long did Muhammad stay in the desert? Nope. Six. Nope. Six. Six years. When, when did Amana take him back? What, what, what did you say? Four years. Four years. Four years. But then there's another narration that said he was the most eloquent, even though he didn't stay up to eight years. How did that happen? Allah was his teacher. Right? Allah was his teacher. In the desert land of the Banu Sa'd tribe, he did learn fluent Arabi. One day Abu Bakr came up to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, ma ra'aytu afsahu mink. I have never heard anyone who is as eloquent as you. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, how else could that be? I was raised with fi bani Sa'd bin Bakr. I was nursed and raised amongst the Banu Sa'd tribe. Rasulullah was asked, Tell me about your early childhood. He said, Abi Ibrahim. I am the answer of the dua of my father Abraham. I am the answer to his supplication. رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ I'm the answer to that. وَبُشْرَى أَخِي عِيْسَى And I am the good news of my brother Isa. The Christians will, uh, will translate that the, the gospel as the good news. But the Muslim theologians, they will say what Isa السلام, meant about the good news was Muhammad I am the good news of my brother Isa. So some of the nomadic tribes had a high reputation for nursing and for taking care of the kids and for teaching pure Arabic. Amongst them were the Bani Sa'd tribe. And parents want the best education for their kids. Who do you think Amina, which tribe did Amina want to take care of her child? Bani Sa'd, Ibn Bakr. So these wet nurses from the desert would come periodically to the city of Mecca to visit the noble families of the Quraysh for nursling. One of the women that came by was a woman by the name of Halima a Sa'diya, the daughter of Abu Du'ayb. So let us read now from page 96, the third paragraph. If someone, if you don't have your book, just listen along. If I can have a volunteer for someone to read out loud. This is first, so she's speaking from her own, this is her own narration from where she said. It was a year of drought and famine and we had nothing to eat. I rode on a brown mule. We also had with us an old she-camp. By Allah, we could not even get a drop of milk. We could not have anything to eat during the night for the child. Thank you, thank you so much, Nasir. We'll, we'll, we'll pause there. Uh, some may ask, well, wasn't Abdul Muttalib, the chief of the Quraysh, wasn't he loaded, mashallah? Uh, yeah, he was the chief of the Quraysh, but he was getting old. 
And when he is about, when he dies, who do you think will, will inherit? The sons or the grandson? The, son. the sons. And now, okay, how about Amina? She rich or poor? She's poor as well. What about Abdullah? <laughs> He's dead. He has passed away. And he only leaves behind a few camels, I believe five in particular, a small flock of sheep and goats, and of course, Abdullah's slave, Um Ayman. That's it. That's it. So Muhammad was by far the poorest nursling uh, in, in that time. He was by far the poorest. And as for the foster parents, they don't have to be rich, but they don't have to be, they shouldn't be poverty stricken as well. So whenever there would be a choice between Halima and another foster mother, the biological mother would always choose the other. So much so, by then, every one of the Banu Sa'd women, except Halima, was left without a child. All of them had a baby except Halima. The poorest nurse was without a nursling, and the poorest nursling was without a nurse. Brother Kenneth, can you please read the second paragraph? Every woman who came with me got a suckling infant, and when we were about to depart, I said to my husband, By Allah, I do not, I do not like to go back to the other women without any infant. I should go to that orphan, and I must take him. He said, There is no harm in doing so, and perhaps Allah might bless us through him. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Stop right there. What does Halima mean? Has anyone ever heard of the word Hilm? Is it patient? It's similar to Sabr. But it's even not just patient, it's forbearing. Meaning, you don't even show the anger on your face. Rasulullah taught us that the name of a child has an impact on the child. So this could be one of the reasons why she said, all right, let's take this child. And remember, don't forget about the husband. We often praise Halima. Not many people talk about Harith. Like they say, behind every strong woman is a strong man that supports her. I think I, think I may have switched <laughs> But yeah, don't forget about Harith. Right? So you brought, uh, Rahima had a question. So she was asking me that how uh, he's talking about uh, Allah when Prophet was still a small baby. What, one more time? So when we read Allah, maybe Allah would bless us through him. Yeah. So her question was, how did they believe in Allah when Prophet was still a small baby? Okay, yeah. So if you, this is mentioned in the Quran as well, that if you would ask the pre-Islamic Arabs who created the heavens and the earth, they will all would say, Allah. But they believed in order to get closer to Allah, we, we should create these minor gods and goddesses. And Allah and al uzza if you look at their history, they were actually noble people. To honor them, they created the idols. And over time, they started to worship the idols. But Allah is saying, Islam is not a new ideology. This is, Allah is a God that Adam salam believed in, Musa, Isa. So it's not just reserved for Muslims to worship Allah. More for helping others. What Hadith's mindset was, this is the Islamic framework. You help others when they can't do anything for you. Whereas sometimes we think, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You help me today, I will help you tomorrow. But this is not the Isla Islamic framework is, I be there for someone even when I know they can't even help me in the future. So this infant may not benefit us monetary wise for the sake of barakah, let's take care of him. Did they have barakah? Yes. Of course they did. Right? Halima began to produce a great deal of milk. Previously, as Sister Nasia mentioned, her breast didn't have enough milk for even a single child. Her child, her child would cry a lot and this prevented the child from sleeping at night and prevented her from sleeping. Now she has milk for her and Muhammad the baby is now able to sleep. Man, I miss those days, sleeping like that. Okay. And then the sheep, 
that belonged to Halim and Harith also began to flow with plentiful milk. Previously, their udders would remain dry and empty. The donkey that she rode on the city of Mecca was slow and weak, but on the way back to the desert, it recovered speed. Was this the last time that Rasulullah encountered the people of Bani Sa'd ibn Bakr? Was this that absolute last time? More than 50 years later, after the Battle of Hunayn, he encounters them one more time. And who does he encounter? Not Hal Halima's daughter, Shayma. Shayma. So she was, many people were taken as prisoners of war. The Prophet's foster sister, Shayma, was amongst those that were taken prisoner. She said, I'm your foster sister. Muhammad said, how do I know? She said, I used to carry you as a child. You bit me as a child. Here's the mark. <laughs> Raise your hand if you ever got picked last. <laughs> whether it's on a team, whether it's being invited for a party. Right? If you're feeling sad about the last time you got picked last, remember that Muhammad Wasallam was picked last. He وسلم, was picked last. Nobody wanted the orphan child. You're sad because you got picked last. He wasn't even about to get picked. Last moment, Halima said, all right, I'll, I'll take him. Next time someone says, you're the last pick, you should say, they saved the best for last. As Sheikh Salabi writes, What Allah chooses for his servants is best for them. Allah chose an infant an orphan for Halima, even though she didn't want to take this orphan. In the end, she took him because there were no other options available. Allah's choice was best for her. Don't regret on missing out what Allah did not plan to give you. <coughs> for four years, the orphan Muhammad Sallallahu was looked after by Halima and lived with the Banu Sa'd Bedouins in the Arabian desert. He shared the nomad's life in the most barren and difficult natural environment. But this spurred, not boredom, but this spurred contemplation. And he didn't know it yet. He was about to go through his first trial. And later on, the Quran would talk about this early childhood in the desert by saying, did we not find you an orphan and grant you shelter? <laughs> the splitting of the chest. In sh right. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. I need a volunteer to please read the last page of page 97. Okay, I, think, uh, can, I think a few of you only have the updated books. So can I just read it again? The last page of page 97. The last paragraph, sorry. The Prophet stayed with him until he was about four or five years old. Then, as related by Anas and Sahih Muslim, Gabriel came down, opened his chest, and took out the heart. He then extracted a blood cloud of it and said, that was the part of the Satan, Satan envy. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Hada hadu shaytanu mink. Jibreel said, this is the portion of shaitan that was in you. In another hadith, Rasulullah said, every time a newborn uh, enters the world, shaitan pricks him. And that is one of the reasons why the newborn cries. This is something that Rasulullah said, so we, should, we have to believe it. This is one of the reasons why. So some physicians will also state that babies cry. Uh, this will kickstart their lungs. Some physicians say that some, some babies don't cry. But Allah says, as soon as the baby enters the world, the, I'm sorry, before the baby enters the world, they are in fi qararim makin, a firm lodging, a safe place. They are resting in the most comfortable place that you can imagine. They are effortlessly fed, their body waste is invisibly removed, They're, they have the reassuring body noises from their mother, it's heaven. 
then just when you are getting used to, to this life of luxury, you are forcefully removed and you are kicked out from qararim makin, as Allah says in Surah Al-Mu'minun. And then people are sticking tubes down all of these places. You are, you are being touched in a manner that you've never been touched before. And then to add insult to injury, shaitan pricks every newborn baby. And no wonder babies cry when they come out of the womb. Shaitan wants to harm the child as soon as it comes out. Not from day one, but from minute one. This causes the black spot in our heart. And this black spot was taken out from the heart of Muhammad وسلم, in his early childhood. And this black spot that all of us have, perhaps this is where waswas comes from. Sometimes you get a vulgar thought that comes to your mind. And you say, where the heck did that thought come from? That's from shaitan. That's not from you. That's from shaitan. From that black spot. Shaitan will say on the day of judgment, ma, ma min sultan. I did not have any power over you. I could not force you to do anything. Illa an da'autukum. The only thing I did was waswas. Fastajabtum li and you listened to my waswas. So as powerful as shaitan is, remember shaitan cannot control us, he cannot force us to do anything. And if you are having these negative thoughts, this does not mean you have low iman. This does not mean you have low faith. As Rasulullah said, Allah has overlooked my ummah for all of the negative thoughts that they will have. But a person should not act upon those negative thoughts. He should not say, hey, these are the negative thoughts. Bad thoughts are just that. They are just thoughts. Islamically, these bad thoughts don't reflect you as a person. Because the mind is only one part of us. We got the nafs, we got the ruh, we got the physical body, we got the spiritual heart, right? So this means if you're having a bad thought that comes to your mind, your mind is not you, it's just a part of you. You don't have to believe your negative thoughts. Immediately do the ta'awud, a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. You can say the second last surah of the Qur'an, surah al-falaq. You can say the second last surah of the Qur'an, the last surah of the Qur'an, surah al-nas. You can recite ayat al-kursi to get rid of the waswas. And the next time you have a vulgar thought, in addition to trying all of the, uh, reading the surahs and the duas that I just mentioned, next time this vulgar thought comes in, Allow it to come in. Don't fight it. Allow that negative thought to come in and then say, Hello thought. I know, I know you're not real. You're just a thought. And you can stay there if you want to. But I have a lot of things that I need to do today. So you can stay there if you want to. But I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Assalamu alaikum. And you, you continue on with your day. So these negative, vulgar thoughts that all of us get, it was cut off from Muhammad wasallam at the age of four. This is proven in a hadith. That every child that is born, Iblis assigns a qareen to that person. These qareen are with us 24-7. They know us better than, ever, than anyone else. The Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, even you? Even me. But Allah helped me against him. He has now accepted Islam and he only whispers good things to me. This shows that the relationship that Rasulullah had with the Qareen has been severed when he was four years old. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Anas ibn Malik said, I could see the traces on his chest. I mean, and he was relating this hadith when he was 60. And Allah could have made it so that there is no trace. But for us to believe it, right, we see and we believe. He made sure that there were still traces. So that physical line was still there. Back to Amina. So this incident of the splitting of the chest 
it concerned Halima and Harith. They thought their foster son had an evil spell on him. That it, yes? Uh, you said that uh, Allah doesn't count the negative thoughts in the mind of uh, what about the positive thoughts? Do we get any? If you actually had the intention to perform those positive thoughts, you do get rewarded for them. Yep. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِنْ بِنْ نِيَاتِ Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to have actually another sc uh, sc scholar because that's a whole different topic. The difference between nafs and ruh, you're gonna, we're going to need another lecture to discuss that. So yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. So there's nafs, so scholar, just briefly they say there's nafs, there's ruh, there's the, the physical heart, I'm sorry, the spiritual heart, the physical body, and, and there's one more. Uh, and the mind. The mind. Okay, so back to Amina. So they decided, let's give him back to Amina, Halima and her husband. Halima asked, why now? Her, his time is not up. She, she said, no, no, his time is up. Halima was, not, was no fool. This change was too abrupt. Tell me what happened, Halima. They were, not, they were not telling Amina what happened, the incident of the splitting of the chest. Finally, they told Amina what happened. She dismissed those fears and she said, great things are in store for my son. And then she told the two about the dream that she had, about the light going all the way to Iraq and Hashem. Halima was reassured. But this time, Amina decided to keep her son. And she said, leave him with me. Have a safe journey home. When Muhammad Sallallahu comes back to Amina, he Sallallahu would play with Hamza and Safiya, the children of Abdul Muttalib's last marriage. Remember the family tree that uh, Sister Nasiya posted on, on, on the oh, 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 chalkboard. So when he was six years old, Amina decides to take him on a visit to Yathrib to see his family members and to also visit at the grave of his father. There he, there he learned how to swim in a pool and the boys taught him how to fly a kite. Life was good. On the way back to Mecca at a place called Abu'a, Amina felt ill and she starts to die. So Muhammad is watching his mother pass away. Amina whispers to Baraka, be a mother to him, O Baraka, and never leave him. And she passes away. She is buried at a place called Al Abwa. In Ibn Sa'd, in the Tabaqat, and in Sahih Muslim, it is written that more than 50 years later, Muhammad Sallallahu is coming back from Mecca to Medina, and then he takes a detour to Abwa. A few of the people that were close to him, his inner circle, they go around, they go with Muhammad Sallallahu they leave the caravan, and they follow him. He sits down at a grave for a little while and then he starts to cry. After a little while he starts to sob. He starts to sob so uncontrollably that some of the companions had to, had to calm him down. And when the companions saw him crying like this, they all started crying like this. This is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. They all started crying. And then Finally, when he regained his composure, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, what makes you cry? He said, this is the grave of my mom. Adrakatni rahmatuhu fabakait. I remembered the compassion and the mercy that she displayed to me during my early childhood. Fifty years later, even after being a father, even after being a grandfather, even after being a prophet, he remembers his mom. So those of, who, who here does not have a mom? Uh, who, who, whose mother passed away? Raise your hand. Okay. So those of us who, whose mothers are alive, when we see this next time on our phone, pick up. Because there are people here who wish that they, they could receive this call.
Why was Muhammad Sallallahu given such a harsh childhood? Humility. He must have felt a great sense of vulnerability and humility by having a harsh childhood. If everything was given to him, he may not have learned humility. He may not have felt that vulnerability. And those feelings were intensified when his mother passed away. Another reason, he was left utterly dependent on Allah. And he became close to the most destitute of people. Baraka, Um Ayman, Abdullah, I'm sorry, Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib. So the Quran reminds him never to forget where he came from. Never to forsake the underprivileged and the needy. Also, to turn and to use the trials that he had into a positive positive teaching experience. How can you talk about being how can you talk about what it's like being an orphan if you weren't an orphan yourself? Another quality that you cannot learn without going through difficulty is patience. You cannot even though people today write books on patience, on perseverance and going through hardships, but when, the, the, when you read their bio like this guy, this, this guy, mashallah, he, he, he has millions. He was, he was born a millionaire. He went to a great school. He had a great upbringing. Why is he writing a book on patience? It doesn't make sense. Right? So Muhammad Sallallahu he didn't have pe some pe Some people write books on patience and fortitude, but they had beautiful, they had pa parents. They didn't grow up poor. Their family members didn't abandon him. They didn't have little kids throwing stones at him. They, their own people didn't insult him. What do you know about, about patience? There are leg many legitimate organizations that help out the orphans. You do your homework um, and find out which organization that you want to give to. Rasulullah said, Ana wa kafiru fil jannati hakada. The one who takes care of an orphan, me and him will be like this in paradise. And he stuck out his index finger and his middle finger and he said, This is how close we will be. The one who takes care of an orphan. So do what you have to do if that means you know, less going out, uh, less coffee, maybe lower your monthly cell phone bill. Do what you have to do. And the last slide for today, thought this would be a, a creative homework assignment. We'll create our own Sira cookbook recipe. Share your favorite dish or snack next week with a picture and share the whole recipe. Don't give me the fake recipe. I know some of the sisters don't, don't like sharing some of their uh, recipes. Make sure you share all of the contents of that recipe. And then I'll have the office make copies of everyone's favorite dish or snack. Uh, so, and, and then we'll, we'll print it out into a booklet and we'll give it to everyone and then you can share it with your mother. Uh, you don't have to wait for Mother's Day, but this is something we can do uh, for our mothers, inshallah. And then please sign up on the Google Doc so you can actually bring in that favorite snack or dish for everyone in, in the banquet hall for our Sira program. All right, inshallah, we'll meet next week. Assalamu alaikum wa